Okay, so today I'm going to talk to you. Um, we're going to introduce the class BME 2104, Cell Molecular Biology for Engineers. This term, we're having to provide this lecture as uh, online material uh, due to the fact that we've uh, been reduced, the number of class times that we have has been reduced by one. Uh, I am Professor Barker, Tom Barker, uh, in the Biomedical Engineering Department. Your instructors uh, for this course this year, uh, for fall 2018, are going to be myself uh, and Professor Kevin James. We have two TAs uh, this term. Uh, the first is Sham Singh, uh, and the second is Emily Davenport. In addition, uh, this term, uh, we have two talented uh, postdoctoral fellows. Uh, that are in training to become faculty, and they will be providing um, a series of guest lectures. That would be Dr. Ping Hu uh, and Dr. Dan Ababayu. So what I want to talk to you about today is really running through the course objectives, uh, some of the expectations for the class, and some of its structure. Um, so the main course uh, objective is um, for you to master base, both the basic knowledge and the central concepts of cell and molecular biology, in particular those that are essential that we feel like are essential for the practice of biomedical engineering. Now you will notice that we've highlighted in blue um, font uh, two terms, uh, basic knowledge and central concepts. And this is to remind me uh, to mention that throughout this course, uh, the slides have been marked in this way. Uh, anything that is in blue text is something of critical importance uh, that we want to bring your attention to. So this helps you to navigate. Essentially, we've uh, attempted to curate the material to a certain degree um, in order to provide some contextual clues about what we feel is absolutely uh, central uh, so if you see something in blue, um, I would certainly pay attention to that. So number two uh, in the course objectives is uh, for you to be able to relate the knowledge and concepts of cell and molecular biology to its clinical application. Uh, this could be the ideology, the pathogenesis, and the treatment of human diseases. And finally, the third uh, main course objective is uh, to have you get to a point where you understand the process of technical, technical communication and scientific publishing. And we're going to do this through a team writing uh, of an opinion article uh, and individually writing peer reviews of another team's article. And we'll talk a little bit about that activity uh, later in this lecture. So accessibility. So we pride ourselves in uh, both uh, Professor James and myself uh, pride ourselves in being accessible to students. Um, again, your two instructors, uh, myself, Dr. Barker, um, and Dr. James, we will always be available uh, 15 minutes before and after class. Um, we um, show up before class uh, in order to make sure that we can work through any technical issues that we might have in preparing the lecture. Uh, and this would be a, an appropriate time for clarification questions um, from either um, the material that we're providing, uh, the pre-lecture material that we're providing, uh, but no real serious questions. Um, we'll also be uh, available 15 minutes after class, again, primarily focused on clarification questions um, regarding the lecture itself. Um, this would also be the uh, opportunity if there are events that are coming up that you feel like we need to be aware of regarding your attendance, uh, this would be the point in time to bring those up. We do both have dedicated office hours, um, and you'll notice that um, I have, uh, first off, uh, a Monday or Wednesday from 4 to 5. Um, and I want to make a special note that this particular office hour uh, is intended to be the day before any quiz or exam. So um, in the fall term, unfortunately, due to the way the schedule works out, uh, we have uh, quizzes and or exams either on Tuesdays or on Thursdays. And so when we have an exam or a quiz on a Tuesday, we will hold an office hour on the, the prior day being Monday. Uh, as um, 
Uh, as you can imagine then, if we have a quiz or an exam on Thursday, uh, we will hold our office hour the day before on, on Wednesday. Uh, these um, office hours will be held in MR6, that's the adjoining building to MR5, so if you can gain access uh, to MR5 uh, and the lab space uh, in MR5, you can walk through the building uh, in order to get to 3502. Uh, I believe both MR5 and MR6 should be accessible to BME students, um, and so you should have no problem accessing uh, these doors. If you do have an issue, um, please uh, see the BME office uh, and we'll, we'll make sure that you have access. Okay, so uh, we will also um, both hold um, office hours on Friday from 4 to 5. During my lecture periods, that would be in quarters 1 and 2, uh, I will hold them in my office, which is in MR5, room 1229. When Dr. Jaynes is providing his lectures, that would be in quarter three and quarter four, uh, he will hold office hours and they will be in MR5 uh, 2225. I will not, uh, just for a point of clarification, Dr. Jaynes will not be holding office hours during my lecture periods. Uh, again, that would be quarter one and quarter two. Likewise, I will not be holding office hours when Dr. Jaynes is lecturing. Uh, again, being in quarter three and quarter four. So we are both good by email, uh, and we are both good by appointment. Um, we are, however, very bad by phone. So, in fact, I don't answer my office phone. Uh, and I'm absolutely lousy, as is Dr. Jane's, in spontaneous visits. We're, as you can imagine, very busy. Uh, we have multiple um, will say um, obligations uh, as professors um, and spontaneous visits are not usually uh, met with um, terribly positive <laughs> responses. Um, as an addition uh, on the syllabus you'll see that there's a designation um, for any email that you might send, send to us uh, that we ask you to put in the subject line and what this allows us to do is it's a very specific designation for this class that tells us that A, this is about the class, B, it allows us to manage our emails uh, such that we can have those emails going into a folder that we, that we check regularly. So please view um, the syllabus carefully and look for that designation. Uh, if you don't add that, we simply cannot guarantee that the email will even, even be seen. The TAs, again I mentioned, are Sham and Emily. Uh, their office hours are to be decided. Uh, in the initial email that I sent out, uh, there's a link to a survey, uh, and students of this class are asked to go in uh, and um, select uh, their desired office hours. Uh, those with the highest votes uh, will obviously be uh, when Sham and Emily give their office hours. Tutors, we don't have any defined tutors uh, for, this, um, for this class. Uh, however, if additional tutoring is necessary or needed or desired, um, then you're more than free to contact uh, Dr. Jaynes or myself, Sham and Emily, and we'll try to help uh, find you some help that you can then schedule independently. Again, as I mentioned before, MR5 and MR6 uh, you should be able to use the doors with a university ID card um, and uh, there are a few of the doors that only allow uh, medical center IDs and, and those will obviously not work for you guys. Okay, so really quickly, um, before each class there are going to be a number of activities that uh, you need to perform uh, in order to be prepared and, and ready for the lecture material. The first is that um, many times, but not all times, um, we will provide a pre-lecture video on CoLab. Uh, we've done this, we've, we are not teaching a flipped class, but there's a lot of material that we have to cover in this course, uh, and instead of focusing on a lot of the most basic information in a topic uh, within class time, uh, we've chosen to um, record basically these pre-lectures that, that walk you through uh, the basic um, uh, vocabulary, the basic 
parts and pieces of, of what we're going to discuss in lecture. And that allows us a little more time in lecture to field questions, to talk about the clinical relevancy of what we're talking about, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so there'll be a link to a YouTube video. Uh, again, this link will be on CoLab, uh, and we'll always provide that link um, well in advance of, uh, of the class. Uh, each of these pre-lectures are approximately 30 minutes, uh, so they don't require a significant amount of time. However, you are expected to be, uh, you will be um, responsible for this, uh, for this information, and it is fair game for any testing uh, via quizzes or exams. Uh, so there I've said it. You will be held accountable for any of the pre-lecture material. Okay, so if desired, uh, you will prepare also for an in-class 10-minute quiz. And I'll go through this a little bit more detail uh, in subsequent slides. Um, but here is the link. Uh, we use Question Press, which allows you to take uh, any quiz or exam um, online. Uh, and this is the link in order to access that. We suggest that prior to your first class, uh, which is on Tuesday, uh, that you access questionpress.com uh, uh, and uh, explore, explore the website. Uh, it is very critical that you bring a charged laptop, tablet, or smartphone for the quizzes and exams. Again, we'll be holding a quiz every single week, either on a Tuesday or on a Thursday, depending on the schedule. Uh, and these things will be taken, will, um, you'll only be able to take the quiz via laptop, tablet, or smartphone, uh, and therefore it's important that you, you bring one. Uh, furthermore, we also cannot guarantee that there are enough plugs uh, for folks to, uh, to plug up uh, these devices, and so make sure it's charged and ready to go. Finally, uh, the quizzes uh, will consist of approximately seven multiple choice or free answer questions. Uh, and we'll get to this if desired part here in a bit, um, but we'll be holding quizzes uh, every single week and exams at the end of each uh, of four quarters within this class. Uh, the nice thing about taking uh, these quizzes uh, online is that they're graded immediately uh, and we follow them up with about five minutes of, of Q&A, running through the answers uh, and any questions uh, regarding those. Okay, and so uh, this lecture is prepared for us to give live, but um, it says, uh, you know, just like the mock quiz on the first day of class, uh, we will take a mock quiz on the first day of class just to make sure that A, everybody can get online, can access the quizzes, uh, and then we can run through just a single question, I think it's two questions, in order to make sure that, that everyone understands, understands the process. So we will be doing this on the first day of class, so come prepared. Okay, so let's get to uh, the grading, um, and this is where we'll have an opportunity to discuss quizzes versus exams versus both. Um, and so. One of the things students have, this course has been designed so that you guys have the option to take weekly quizzes and or quarterly exams. Um, so quizzes are gonna cover about one week of material. As I mentioned, we'll have them weekly. And exams are gonna cover one quarter of material, including the last quarter. So there is no comprehensive exam in this class. Each quarter um, has an exam associated with it. On the fourth quarter, your exam period will be during the final examination, scheduled final examination period, but it'll be only a test on the fourth quarter material. Okay, so how does this work? Uh, so for example, if you take both the quizzes and the exams, so let's say, let's just look at quarter one for example, I think there are four quizzes uh, and one exam. So let's say you take all four quizzes and the exam. What we're gonna do is we're actually gonna we'll, um, add up the quizzes uh, and we'll ask which is the higher of the two scores. Did you score higher on the quizzes or did you score higher on the exam? Whichever you scored the highest on, we're gonna count that as your quarter grade. Um, and so, in fact, I guess I should go back. 
um, on the day of an exam, you'll actually, will actually be holding both a quiz and the exam on that day. So the fourth, so for instance in quarter one, the fourth quiz is on the same day as the quarter exam, okay? Um, and so what oftentimes might happen is that students will begin to take the quizzes. Um, if they're unhappy <laughs> with their performance, then they may choose uh, to stop taking the quizzes or not c concern themselves with the quizzes and focus only on the exam. Likewise, some students uh, like taking the quizzes and, and are doing exceptionally well on them. Uh, they would then, on the exam day, come in for the first 15 minutes of, of that class period, take the quiz. If they're happy with what they believe their quiz score is going to be for that quarter, they can actually get up and walk out. They do not have to take the exam. Um, some folks choose to take the quizzes, all the quizzes, and the exam and see which one uh, they do better on. Okay. Uh, there are no makeups or no givebacks because if you miss a quiz, you always have the exam that you can take. And so uh, we simply don't do it. Uh, there are, under certain circumstances, um, have been in the past students who have asked to take the quizzes remotely. If that's something, let's say that you're, um, you're in one, on one of the athletic teams uh, and you're going to be away and you want to take the quiz but you want to take it remotely, there are possibilities to do that. You need to contact the TAs uh, and, and the instructors in order to organize uh, exactly how to, uh, how to do that. Um, on the exams, however, uh, they will be both about four to five times, so about this, the equivalent of the exam, or excuse me, the quizzes that you would have taken during that, uh, during that time. Uh, because there are so many questions, we will provide uh, a printout for navigation. On the exams, if you're sick uh, or you have uh, an excuse, uh, a, a, you know, a qualified excuse, uh, we will schedule a single makeup exam in order to cover that material. But it's absolutely critical that you alert us ahead of time if you know that you're going to miss the exam. Even if you wake up the morning of the exam and you are throwing up and there is absolutely no way you're going to get in, go ahead, please email the TAs and ourselves uh, that you're going to miss this so that we can get you on the list um, of makeup exams. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, so-called tricky questions. Uh, this is only my second time uh, teaching this class, uh, but this class uh, has uh, a history, uh, according to students, of, of presenting tricky questions. And I want to discuss that at this point in time so that we're on the same page. Um, of course, so what I'd like to do in order to give you an illustration of what these tricky questions might look like is uh, to do a little bit of a verbal exercise here. Of course, this is, uh, works much better in person, uh, but I'm going to try, uh, attempt to do this in this uh, recorded fashion. So let's say pots quickly about a dozen times. Pots, 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 pots. What do you do at a green light? Now, Normally, what you would say is stop, because you're so used to saying it's a verbal trick, right? Pots, 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 and verbally we want to say stop, right? Because it's so close, and uh, but the actual answer is go. This is the essence of these tricky questions, and what it gets to is this idea of developing regurgitative study habits, right? So things like building up, um, trying to memorize. Uh, strictly memorized material. Um, a lot of times what this does is it's going to trick you into thinking that you really know the material, right? Um, pots, 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 and then we ask a simple question, but it's in a reverse order than what you're used to, and you make a knee-jerk reaction, you answer the question, but you haven't actually stopped to think about what the question is actually asking. 
This is the essence of these tricky questions. And so what both Dr. Jaynes and I are going to strongly suggest is that you try to avoid these regurgitative study habits um, and try you know, fewer flashcards, fewer of these memorization techniques, and focus more on talking about cell and molecular biology. Talk about it with your peers. Talk about it with us. Ask questions in class. Get clarifications. Get to a point where you really understand the material. And there are going to be plenty of opportunities for you to do this with your peers through the writing of these manuscripts, through studying, uh, with the TAs, um, through the online materials, excuse me, the online resource known as Piazza, which you can find on the CoLab site, uh, and with us, uh, me being uh, both uh, Dr. Barker and Dr. James. The other thing is that we want to really encourage you guys to just stop for a minute. And when you read the question, think about the actual intent, uh, the intent of each question. Are we asking you a simple recall question, right? Like, what is the definition of X? What, what does A interact with, right? Versus a critical thinking question. Does it have you think about a process, right? Okay, so that's the quizzes and exams. And again, I'll hold a little bit of a Q&A at the beginning of class, uh, the first day of class, in order to address any concerns that have come up uh, as a response uh, to this introductory material. So 60% of your grade is focused on quizzes and exams, right? So the actual, um, actual material of the class that we're lecturing on. The next 30% is going to be that of a team paper, okay? So team papers are going to be focused. You'll see on the syllabus, we'll eventually post a topic. Um, these will be papers, uh, teams of three of you. Uh, the three members of each team will be selected by us, right? So we are going to construct the teams. And the point of constructing these teams is to try to diversify the teams, both across different levels of skill, different levels of experience, of background, right? And the goal here is that oftentimes you're working on teams that have very different skills than yourself, very different backgrounds, very different capabilities, and it's important that you're able to work within these pretty diverse teams in order to generate a product uh, of high quality, okay? And so this is not just educational, it's uh, from a standpoint of cell molecular biology, it's really about trying to teach you guys uh, how to deal with, how to deal with conflict, how to deal with um, perhaps even uh, differing motivations, um, and so these are, these are all quite critical. Uh, there is um, what we're going to call a nuclear option uh, this term. So very, very rarely um, there's just an, an absolutely inconsolable um, team that just simply cannot function. Okay? Uh, the only time uh, in this particular case, on this particular term, we're going to allow an option that someone can actually get voted off, quote unquote, the island, right? So there are only three of you. So, you know, the, the two that are choosing to vote someone off, they have to do that paper on their own. The one that gets voted off has to do their paper on their own, right? So it's not a great option for anybody. And the only way we're going to allow it is after significant consultation with the TAs to try to resolve any conflicts that arise, or the professors, myself or Dr. James, in order to try to, to resolve any conflicts uh, that exist. So this is the end of the line, um, and, and it is really um, uh, pretty drastic, uh, and so we're going to be quite hesitant uh, to allow teams to do this without significant consultation. So what is the purpose? Uh, the purpose of this exercise is to begin to introduce you guys with the idea of crafting a professional manuscript. One that in this case is going to be an opinion article uh, and we're going to pick a poorly studied molecule or biological process that has some level of controversy uh, surrounding it. Uh, the goal is to get you to a point where you can um, create papers with perfectly formatted primary references. These are not 
Wikipedia or websites um, that are providing information, but, but primary scientific literature uh, in the form of, um, of original, original works. We want you to begin to practice writing in a very clear and concise um, method, uh, clear and concise way. And we need you guys to begin thinking about how to lay forth a, hypothe a hypothesis that is falsifiable. In other words, one can actually prove the hypothesis is null. The first submission, which you should not consider a draft, it is a complete submission of the manuscript, is not graded, but is going to be peer reviewed with an editorial summary. So essentially how this is gonna work is that your team will submit a submission. Uh, that manuscript will then be um, dispersed to other members of the class, not in your own team. And those individuals will then read your paper and construct a peer review uh, on the critical scientific facets. We're not looking for copy editing here. The, the key scientific contribution um, the, the validity of the argument, um, holes in the argument, right? So constructive criticism that helps the authors of that submission now generate a better final draft, okay? So grades are gonna f ultimately for this paper be assigned by the editors. That would be your two TAs, Dr. Jaynes and myself, Dr. Barker. And that's going to be based on the final revised submission. So you will submit an initial draft. That initial draft will go to three of your classmates who are not in your group. Those three individuals will generate independent, individualized reviews of your manuscript with suggestions about how to fix. Right? You will then take those revisions, or excuse me, those reviews, and you will uh, generate a revised submission with a point-by-point -point, uh, response to each of the reviewers concerns. Those final submissions and your ability to address the peers, uh, your the uh, peers reviews, excuse me, peer reviews uh, will determine your final grade. Now there's benefits in this, right? So one is that of your team, let's say you're on a member of it's person A, B, and C. Now when you flip into peer review mode, you're going to be reviewing, your team will review three different manuscripts, right? Person A will, will review, let's say, let's say your team one. Um, member A might review team 16's paper, and person B might review team 7's paper. And member C may review team member uh, team 20's paper. And so you're going to have the opportunity to see other people's work. Now, obviously, you cannot plagiarize their ideas, but there's an opportunity then as a group to come back and say, oh, I saw this team did a really great job of X or Y or Z. And I think we might want to consider that type of an approach uh, on our paper, right? So it does, it both benefits the team and their ability to make their paper better, but it also um, rewards the reviewers, right? Because they can take that experience and that information back to their own teams. Okay, so recommendations for the team paper. Don't think in terms of right or wrong. There are no right or wrong answers. Uh, the grade here is going to be determined by the combination of your logic and your scientific understanding. Okay? Uh, there are controversies for a reason because we haven't gotten to a point where we dogmatically know the right or wrong answer. And therefore, there is a debate in the field of cell and molecular biology on the topics that we, that we choose. And so, again, don't think in terms of right or wrong. And that can be quite difficult for second years. Um, but think more along the lines of using your logic in combination with the scientific understanding that you're developing uh, through reading these original, uh, original works. Number two is that the topic will steer you towards material 
that we cover early in the semester, and that's done intentionally. But it's absolutely critical. The best papers always look for clues and connections throughout the class. Okay? So the topical area, while it will be focused on something covered early in class, there will be connections uh, to material taught throughout the class. And the more that you can embrace that and expand upon your scientific understanding in this topical area, the better your paper will likely be. Finally, if your team paper is not about an idea, then you are just writing a book report, right? We want to see a concept, a hypothesis, right? An idea that you're putting forth for consideration based on what you've read and how your team thinks about what you've read, okay? If you are giving us a laundry list of so-and-so did this and so-and-so did that, then what you're doing is writing a book report, and we're not interested in that. And remember, every poorly understood molecule or process is a puzzle waiting to be solved. And someone told me engineers like to solve puzzles. So let's see how well you guys solve this one. The last 10% of your grade will then be based on these individualized peer reviews. And there are lots of motivations for doing peer review for Dr. Jaynes and myself, uh, Sham and, and Emily who might be uh, writing manuscripts. The first is the altruistic purpose, right? Which is that we all want to make the scientific work of others better, right? We want what gets published in peer-reviewed journals to be correct to the best of its ability, right? Uh, because if false information is, is published and gets out into the community, it can lead us in, in wrong directions, right? And so by making others work better, more correct in our eyes, uh, we, we have an opportunity to serve the community. There's also a selfish purpose, which is that it helps us to sharpen our own thinking, right? Um, by reviewing um, my colleagues and others' work, I can begin to think about things in perhaps other contexts, right? Um, it also allows us to see the most cutting edge work. Who's doing what? And how are they going about answering these kinds of questions? And it's in a pre publication state, so you get to see it sometimes as much as a year or more, unfortunately, a year or more before it ever sees uh, the public's eye. Uh, and thirdly is that uh, good reviewers uh, can, can gain a lot of clout or, or respect. So let's talk a little bit about what makes a good peer review. Good peer reviews are unambiguous. They are insightful and incisive, okay? So be direct. Tell them what, what they need. And they're all also both general and specific in their comments, okay? Um, so they, they need to instruct the authors to a certain degree in how to actually make the paper better. You don't want to just say, oh, you have a flaw in your logic. That's not a terribly helpful review if you, you can get to why there's a flaw. You know, this author published this paper that actually contradicts your specific, you know, the premise of your logic, then that is a helpful comment. They can go, they can pull that manuscript. Maybe it's something that they hadn't found. They can pull that manuscript and modify their approach to the paper based on information that you're giving them. Peer comments must be addressed, as I mentioned before, in the final uh, submission, and it must be done in a point-by-point -point response, okay? So you're going to break down, each team will get their three reviews, and they'll break down those reviews in a point-by-point -point fashion. So what are the individual concerns, considerations that the reviewers feel the authors must address in order to make the paper uh, of high enough quality to be, to be published. More details will come as the dates draw near. And uh, on CoLab, we will provide copious amounts of information about how to write, right? How to write scientifically, how to construct a scientific paper, 
examples from past classes, examples from ourselves about how to give you some demonstrative examples about what we're really looking for and what the quality of manuscript that we're looking for. Okay, so enough of the paperwork issues. What are we going to cover in this class? Well, so we are covering cell and molecular biology. Uh, we're going to start by looking at the many categories of biomolecules, lipids, proteins, nucleic acids, carbohydrates that comprise DNA, the protein, membrane domains, right, that help to partition and instruct uh, the biology of the cell, um, how it takes in information from the outside of the cell and transmits it into the cell, into the nucleus to drive things like gene transcription, right? Um, perhaps it's even gene transcription of proteins that will be then secreted that then can subsequently interact with the cell in an autocrine fashion and further change what that cell is doing. We want to understand fundamental processes. Things like membrane transport, replication, transcription, translation, metabolism. We want to understand the extracellular matrix microenvironment, a little bit of mechanotransduction in this class. And then one of the highlights of this class is really understanding cellular immunology. It's a critical topic in bioengineering from everything from understanding the progression of cancer, the development of fibrosis, things that uh, Dr. James and myself study, to regenerative medicine, how inflammation and immunity impact things like cell phenotype uh, and drive either promotive repair or, um, or fibrotic repair. We want to try to tether these fundamental principles to human disease and clinical applications. Uh, from anything from like a rare disease like listeriosis to more common diseases like diabetes. Uh, and finally, we want to seek to identify applications most closely connected to the associated cell and molecular biology. Okay, so I'm going to talk really quickly about a little bit about myself so you get an idea of where I'm from and what I'm all about. and then. I'm going to do my best to introduce Dr. James uh, to a certain degree. All right, so I achieved my, uh, I got my Bachelor's of Science degree um, in a small liberal arts college. I did it in chemistry and I minored in physics. And just to age myself, uh, my degree was conferred in 1995. So that's 23 years ago, Ugh. I received my bachelor's degree. Interesting and fun fact about myself is that somehow I found myself with a degree in chemistry and physics building flight simulators. Uh, and I did that for about a year between my undergraduate and graduate school. Uh, it probably helped that, that um, I had been flying uh, since I was about eight years old. Um, so I, I still can remember my father and grandfather uh, boosting me up on encyclopedias um, and they would run the foot pedals, right, the, the rear rudder, uh, and I would steer the plane landing, um, landing and taking off as early as eight years old. Um, so I thought at one point in time this is what I was going to do for a living, built flight simulators for a company that sold them to all the major airlines. Uh, I've actually built the databases for some major airports like Charles de Gaulle and Paris. Uh, I built the Denver airport, uh, I built the Dallas airport, um, and so uh, I had a lot of fun, fun doing that. Uh, at some point in time, the company said, asked the employees, like, you know, what, we, we can't just do flight simulators. What are some other interesting things we should simulate? And I did a lot of research and got really fascinated with this, this idea of building um, surgical simulators. So one would import information from CT, MRI, PET scans, uh, download that technical information, and actually generate a virtual reality simulator for, uh, for surgeons to actually practice on. In fact, you could do a patient-specific test run of a difficult surgery before you ever saw the patient. Uh, and I got so excited about this that 
when they decided to do bus simulators, uh, I was fed up uh, and left. And, and that, that started my long journey uh, down the path of, of biomedical engineering. I got my master's degree in about 1999, um, and my research focused primarily on creating biopolymers for regenerative medicine. Uh, and I used uh, the inspiration of our own blood clotting protein. So this is the major protein in your bloodstream that, that circulates in an inactive form and is proteolytically cleaved upon activation. Uh, it forms a, um, a dense uh, fibrillar um, meshwork that traps blood cells, uh, red blood cells, platelets, uh, and this polymer matrix is called fibrin. And so. I spent a number of years trying to engineer fibrin to deliver growth factors to instruct um, regenerative medicine outcomes. Uh, I followed that up uh, seamlessly with a PhD in biomedical engineering. Uh, and in this case, I shifted gears from trying to create biopolymers to trying to understand the fundamental mechanisms of how cells and their extracellular matrix. So fibrin is, is one of these extracellular matrices and I was very interested to understand fundamentally things about the cell that help them to recognize what the extracellular matrix is, uh, how to attach to it, uh, and how they might change their phenotype in response uh, to extracellular matrix cues uh, that we provide. So after following my, um, my PhD, I did a postdoc in matrix biology at the University of Washington and the Hope Heart Institute. Um, and during this postdoctoral fellow, I explored the role of uh, a class of proteins known as matricellular proteins. These are extracellular proteins, so they're proteins that are secreted into the extracellular space, but they don't play any structural role. Rather, they act both on the matrix and on cells to regulate things like cell adhesion. Uh, and my interest was in how they regulated cell adhesion critical to matrix assembly. So, Again, this idea from a regenerative medicine perspective, how do you get a cell to make, make a tissue, right? To make the matrix, uh, to populate the matrix, uh, and do this in a way that, that makes, uh, makes regenerative sense. Of course, this was also my first foray into uh, mechanobiology, uh, and I was lucky enough uh, to use one of the earliest intramolecular FRET probes uh, in this case, um, an investigator by the name of Viola Vogel had turned the extracellular matrix protein fibronectin, which is a pretty complicated, very large, complex extracellular matrix protein, into its own FRET probe. And so uh, what this allowed us to do was explore the impact of cell-derived forces. So when cells would grab this protein and exert force on it, uh, the cells can actually change the actual conformation, the shape of that extracellular matrix protein and instruct the, the, the protein's um, biochemical activity. And, and I found this very fascinating. I followed that up with a, a postdoc slash senior scientist position in bioengineering at the Ecole Polytechnique Federale de Lausanne. That's supposed to be the EPFL, not the EFPL. Uh, and that's located in Lausanne, Switzerland. Uh, and here I got to work with, um, I had the pleasure of working with uh, one of the probably preeminent bioengineers, uh, a guy named, by the name of Jeff Hubble. Uh, and in his lab, uh, we began to engineer extracellular matrix proteins, their specific conformation, in order to instruct integrin-specific engagement, uh, driving things like stem cell differentiation. Uh, I have been a professor since 2006 when I left the EPFL. Uh, I started at Georgia Tech um, where I spent uh, 10 years. Uh, about two years ago, well, almost actually two years to the day, um, we, my wife and I and our family uh, moved to Charlottesville uh, to take a professorship uh, at UVA. When I am not uh, in the lab, um, I focus a lot on family. Um, my wife, uh, Dr. Shannon Barker, is also a PhD in biomedical engineering. She uh, serves currently as the Director of Graduate Studies in the School of uh, Engineering and Applied Sciences. Uh, and so she essentially sets policy and runs 
the graduate programs from the dean's office um, on, in all disciplines of, of engineering. Uh, my son Leo, I apologize for the Georgia Tech hat. Uh, this is quite a number of years ago. Uh, and my daughter, uh, Finna. Uh, I have a healthy love of food and cooking. Uh, this is actually a traditional Irish stew that I made uh, during a five-week stint in Galway, Ireland, uh, when Shannon was uh, teaching a study abroad program there. I um, have a really uh, a strong love for food and, and cooking that, that permeates, uh, I hope, permeates even my lab. Uh, I have a love of farm, uh, so we bought this little property way out in the middle of nowhere, Albemarle County. Um, just to say that uh, the sun shines on us, here we have a rainbow over it. Um, when I'm not in the lab, I guarantee you I'm working my rear end off uh, at the farm. And finally, um, our whole family has a very healthy love uh, of travel. and. Um, and we take every opportunity we can to, to go abroad and, and visit new cultures and, and, and new countries. So a little bit about Professor James. Um, he also has, uh, he actually has a bi um, Bachelor of Science in Biomedical Engineering, uh, probably one of the, one of the first. Um, he did this at Hopkins and, and studied actually in the lab of, of one of my good colleagues from Georgia Tech, uh, who had since moved to Georgia Tech, was a graduate student uh, with Dr. Jane studying biopolymers for DNA delivery, uh, which resulted in, in a nice manuscript. He double majored uh, also in Spanish and, and with this was able to get uh, a Fulbright Scholar in Santiago de Compostela in Spain. Uh, again, looking at, at biopolymers for protein and, and chemotherapeutic delivery. So very sort of traditional materials, drug delivery, um, From there, he went and did his PhD in bioengineering, looking at uh, his title of his dissertation being a quantitative analysis of the cytokine-mediated apoptosis cell decision process. From this published a number of um, quite remarkable papers, um, which led then to a postdoc in more traditional cell biology, uh, where he looked at cell specification during memory acinar morphogenesis in vitro again leading to a, a number of, of quite impressive papers. Um, what he was doing as a second year uh, was, um, you can see a couple of videos of <laughs> Professor James. I think I would have broken my neck uh, in that. Um, but he was, a, he was definitely a grinder. <laughs> Loved to ski. Uh, that's something uh, Kevin and I both share. Of course, I'm more of a snowboarder and uh, that came to an early, my snowboarding career came to an end in Switzerland when I, when I broke my back, uh, trying maybe a little bit of what, what Kevin was trying there on those uh, uh, rollerblades. His first real stint in the lab uh, was again uh, as a second year. And so I think the encouragement from both of us uh, is uh, to, to begin even as a second year to start thinking about uh, the possibility of, of joining a lab. And, and exploring your options to join labs. We're both very strong prominence um, 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 for undergraduate research, uh, both in our lab and, and trying to help individuals um, uh, find, find lab homes. So, okay, so things to do in this class, and this should wrap us up. One is remember to think about the evolutionary pressures and constraints on the topics we cover. Nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. Ask questions. We all believe, uh, excuse me, we all benefit intellectually from the discussion, and there is a chance that it could benefit your final grade. Things to do outside of class. Attend office hours if you have questions or need help. Focus on practicing the vocabulary more than memorizing it. Use it in a sentence. Understand how it works. Talk about BME uh, 2104 topics amongst your friends. Ask and answer questions on the Piazza discussion board. So it is, a, it is an open, uh, open forum for students to provide uh, questions. Students can also answer, and the TAs are monitoring 
uh, the Piazza Board. We are monitoring the Piazza Board. It'll be divided up topically. And so we have the opportunity for students to answer and for TAs and professors to come back and say, yes, that's correct, or to tweak those answers, right? So it really is in this dialogue that we have back and forth where we all understand cell biology uh, better and better. By the mid-September, um, be working on your final paper continuously throughout the semester. We cannot understate, <laughs> or overstate, excuse me, we cannot overstate this fact. Because the reality is that if you wait until the last minute, this will not be <laughs> a well-constructed um, manuscript.